Best Movie Ratings is a one-stop, easy and elegant movie ratings experience. Stop wasting your time on bad movies and download the world's best movie ratings app from the iTunes App Store now. Hi everyone, this is Ahmed Karimli and welcome to Be Efficient TV. The mission of this web TV show is to boost the efficiency of your business and life through tips and tricks from leading experts. And today I have with me Tai Wen. Uh, he's a uh, he's the founder of the Uto- Utopian Life. He is a writer, traveler, and uh, international um, chef and athlete. Welcome to the show, Tai. Thank you so much for having me, Ahmed. Really, really enjoy your show and, and appreciate being on. It's a pleasure to have you. So tell me about the adventure of like you know from chef to sport to writing to the living the utopian life. How did you? Why and uh, what and how did you do that? Sure, I think part of it has been my personality. I've always had a very curious tendency and and just wanted to explore life and wanting to live to my my fullest potential and part of that has been to step outside of my comfort zone and explore very different areas uh, a creative side in food and cooking and being a chef and then also wanting to push my physical self and pursue professional fighting and then with with writing pursue my intellectual self so part of it was just a journey of self discovery and trying to find out more about myself what makes me tick And how do I leverage those aspects to create a lifestyle that I find not only meaningful but allows me to live my passions also? Is all of them, all these like writing, cooking, and uh, sports still going on, or it was like certain period of your of your life, and then you quit and you move to the next thing? And can you yeah. just tell me the history, like your background, and how did you start? in each one Absolutely. in each one of these areas. Yeah, sure. Well, I was, I was born in Vietnam and as uh, a six-month-old baby, my parents fled the country after the war. So we were boat people, refugees. We made it over to Indonesia to a refugee camp there. And then from there, we got accepted into Australia where I grew up and really went through a lot of identity issues. You know, I'm, I'm an Asian man. Uh, an Asian child growing up in a very Caucasian Western world. So there was a lot of conflict between who, who am I and trying to, trying to discover that, experiencing a little bit of racism, a little bit of conflict, and, and really struggling to figure out life, which I think is a journey that a lot of us go through, finding out who we are and how, how do we fit into this world, how do we fit into society. And as I asked those questions, I explored the answer through through finding different careers. And so initially, uh, I moved over to Canada after I finished high school and I played rugby over there. I wanted to be a, a professional rugby player. But then from there, I, I transitioned into cooking. I, I, I Basically, I wasn't good enough to be a professional rugby player back in Australia. So I focused on a career in cooking. And I achieved a, a relative amount of success there. And then from that, I moved into the kickboxing, the professional fighting. And, and again, it was just, I did enjoy the cooking, but but it didn't ignite that passion within me. And, and that's when I ventured into kickboxing and so, I moved so over you to worked Thailand. In, you worked as a chef in some hotels or restaurants and, and then you quit the job and uh, how you were living in that period of time. Yeah, I worked for the Hilton Hotel in Brisbane and they, I know they've got locations internationally. So I was doing that. I thought um, I thought it would just be something I'd be very passionate about. And initially I was. I really enjoyed food. I really enjoyed being creative. But after that, it just came to a point where I just couldn't see myself doing it for the rest of my life and I didn't want to continue to invest in something that that I wasn't on fire about. And during that time, I had some friends start kickboxing and they invited me to come to the gym and to train there. And I did that and I had a couple of amateur fights and uh, achieved some success there. And then I got invited to move to Thailand. And again, part of my explorative personality, I, I jumped at this opportunity to move to a different country, to live in Thailand, to pursue the sport full time. So I moved over to Thailand and 
lived there for close to two years. And actually, while I was there, I met some professors from a school in Texas and really built a relationship with one of the, the professors. And he offered me a scholarship to move over to Texas and do my bachelor's degree over there. So after living in Thailand, I, I ended up moving over to Texas, spending four years doing my bachelor's degree there. In what? And it was in humanities, but it was very heavily focused on philosophy and theology. And and so really beginning to immerse myself in that intellectual aspect and and studying history, studying writing. And I eventually finished that and and just realized that I, I had a great passion for for writing. And that's when I stepped out and began to build this brand of the utopian life. You will quit writing soon or, or you will continue this trend? Because I think, is it like quitting and changing into different things is part of the discovering or it's part you are a moody person that you like to change all the time? I think it's it's a little bit of, of both. Initially, I did have a lot of kind of ADD tendencies where I would do something for a little bit. But, but here's the thing, I mean, I think I've come to a point in my life now where I'm about to turn 31 and I've done a lot of different things, a lot of self discovery activities, but I've come to a point where I've realized that a lot of success comes with consistency and investment into something. And while it's been fun reinventing myself in different ways, uh, I think I've come to a point where this is something that's going to be a life lifelong investment uh, for hopefully for the rest of, of my life, I've realized that writing is something I'm very passionate about. Encouraging people to step out and live their dream is something I'm very passionate about. So I would like to say that that this is going to be a venture that I invest a lot of time in. What's the meaning of the utopian life? Sure. So utopia is an idealistic place. So we all have perceptions of, of what is ideal or what, is, what does perfection look like. And oftentimes, you know, we're told that, that that's unrealistic. But, but I think the pursuit of the unrealistic ideals has some great value in it because even although we may not achieve that, getting, getting close to that, uh, is a great goal and a worthy goal to pursue. And that's what the utopian life is about, to, to think of what is your perfect day, what is your perfect week, what does your perfect lifestyle look like, and to work towards that. And now your lifestyle for you is, is uh, you think it's writing and traveling, the mix mixture between uh, between these two areas? Absolutely. Writing. Uh, traveling and eventually I'd, I'd love for this to turn into some uh, some full-time speaking uh, at, at different events on on just just stepping out of your, your comfort zone and, and breaking through some of those barriers that hold us back and, and creating the habits and the systems that will enable a person to to productively move forward towards their dreams. What are the main highlights of your uh, manifesto? One of the major highlights I'd have to say is this idea that that the question is the answer and the journey is the destination. So often we make very clear distinctions between between either or. Uh, I I have to choose between the journey and the destination and oftentimes we focus very much on on reaching a certain goal if only i get to here then i will be happy but what i'm trying to do is close the gap between these distinctions that we make that it's not either this or that it's not either i do this or i do that but it's a balance of, of both so it's embracing the journey of life and also the destinations that we go for so it's it's setting goals and it's pursuing success. But how do we do that? We realize that there are many things that we are already successful in and that we can celebrate, but also use that to fuel us and push us forward toward that goal 
Mm. So just creating a more psychologically holistic and balanced approach to to how we view our lives and, and just to keep momentum constantly going and, and basically realizing that a lot of what we do and a lot of value is found in the journey and not only in the destination. But don't you think sometimes the journey is painful and not necessarily fun, uh, especially with the ideal utopian life? Like, let's say your journey, it's in, into writing and writing is tough. Sometimes you don't think of quitting. Uh, sure. You don't think that is there is a conflict there somehow between the the ideal life, which is fun, and between uh, the pain through the process of consistency. Yeah, absolutely. And it, that actually reminds me of a um, a Zen proverb that says, it says, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And, and so it's this idea that, yeah, there are, there are struggles in, in the journey. There are trials. And, and yes, there is a clear distinction. But at the same time, there's a foundation that that underlies there's a, a, a road that runs through both of them that if we focus also on building a foundation that can that can carry both areas what we struggle through in the journey and what we celebrate in the success can still be carried in in both hands and, and not to put so much weight on on one or the other and that's a struggle that I really went through when I was a chef, it was all about uh, I, I need to become this five-star chef and, and achieve the top in my field. And, and so I ended up working, goodness, like 12 to 14 hours a day because I wanted to pursue this level of excellence. But at the same time, I, I forgot about just enjoying the journey of everything that I was learning. Same as the professional fighting. I wanted to be this champion and and I trained my butt off. I got to fight in Singapore, Fiji, in Canada, and fight in these great places. But I, I didn't get to enjoy being in these different places because I was so focused on, you know, I, I need to win a championship. And so it's about making the distinction, yes, between the journey and the destination, but at the same time having a, a foundation that carries both of them. You started a site called Entrepreneur Journey and uh, like now you stopped it, you focused on the ut utopian life. Why? I mean, you you want to pursue, let's say, writing uh, into entrepreneurship or you quit entrepreneurship or what happened? Yeah, that's 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 a good observation. You know, and I, I tell a lot of people now, there are different approaches that, that people give to starting up a business. Some say you need to be crystal clear with your blueprint and your approach, what do you want? What's your niche? Who's your audience? Who's your demographic? Be 100% clear on that and, and follow that. And initially, that's that's what I did. You know, I took that advice and I wrote down specifically whatever you want. And, and I think that's that's great advice. But I think at the same time, it's, it's not the only effective advice that's out there. And, and realizing for me that things can, can change and, and you can be flexible with the rules that you put in place. So originally the entrepreneur journey was very entrepreneurial and, and business focused. So all the articles, all my interviews that I was doing was very entrepreneurial focused. But I realized there was a part of me that wanted to touch on other topics as well, wanted to touch on lifestyle articles, on more psychological articles, on more philosophical articles. So I did come to this crossroad and, and I thought I just, I wanted to rebrand to become a little broader. And I've learned a lot from that. You know, originally I was very clear cut, very straight and narrow. This is the path. But now I've realized, you know what, your, your goals can change, your goals can can shift and evolve as you learn more. And that's okay. You know, there are some people that work very well when they have a clear path to go towards. But there are other people that want to be very flexible and just go week by week and see where the journey takes them. So 
I definitely see two approaches now and, and I'm leaning more towards this flexible approach where I have my ideas of where I want to be, but at the same time, I'm very okay with completely changing directions. But, but that said, I mean, I'm very happy that I've, I've discovered this and, utopian life branding. In the internet world, like when you gave up the entrepreneur, entre- entrepreneurial niche, uh, you don't struggle with the general utopian life. Right now with the utopian life, you can't talk about business life, different stuff. But in the internet world, especially with you, you hang out a lot with internet experts. Like they didn't advise you to stick with this niche that you can, you know, be famous or like, you know, uh, be out there faster than a general, general term. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was some advice I, I came to and it's true. You know, if you, if you continue to hammer on the niche, you're going to make progress. I think the determining factor for me was that it was still early on in the game for me. I'd, I'd had that brand for, maybe about five months before I, I made this shift. And, and it was still early enough where my audience was going to be affected with the branding, uh, the branding change. So that was timing was, was a big part in that, you know, if I'd been two years down the path with the entrepreneur journey, I don't think I would have changed it because I would have laid a much more solid foundation. So that was definitely a key factor that it was early enough uh, in the game to be able to shift. And I think in those formative years of whatever you're doing, it's it's a buffer zone. It's a safe zone for you to explore and to, to truly find your voice. Um, but definitely as the roots get deeper and deeper, that's when it's more difficult to pivot and to change direction. How did you discover uh, the writing path? Through... Uh, a few other people that were doing it. I, I connected with um, with one gentleman named Kamanzi Constable, who who's a, a writer, but he changed directions in his life from being uh, working in bread delivery to starting a blog and becoming a successful author. And then I was listening to a few other podcasts. John Lee Dumas, who I interviewed in, in person, he has Entrepreneur on Fire, and Lewis House has The School of Greatness. So... They were really making it more well known, making it popular, sharing their stories and sharing other people's stories of being able to create a business and lifestyle online that was location independent. So that's how I came across the idea. And and again, I was I was trying to figure out what can I do with, with my life long term that would really enable me to live out what I'm passionate about. What's the difference between writer and author? An author usually is tied in with a book, having a book published. So a writer uh, is more tied in with journalistic or articles and pieces. And uh, an author has a published book usually. Uh, are you working on a book? And uh, when you f- if you finish your book, you will change your title into author? Do you think it's yeah, more fancy? Absolutely. I think it's different. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of debates between whether it's not, it's more fancy or not, but I have been in contact with a few different literary agents and publishing houses. So I'm about to submit my, uh, my book proposal pretty soon. So I'm excited about that and, and definitely look forward to being able to refer to, to myself as an author. What are some of the famous publications that you wrote for, uh, can you just mention for us some examples for the audience to know? Sure. Uh, Huffington Post would definitely be be up there. That's uh, quite a, a well-known publication that I've been writing for. Uh, entrepreneur.com, they've got a large following. Uh, Elite Daily is a, a publication focused on Generation Y. Uh, Mind Body Green is another, another large one. So those are, are the major ones. I'm actually interacting with an editor from The Atlantic. So hopefully I can have some work featured on there. But those are are some of the major ones. How it works, how the process works to be uh, an author, like a paid author for those publications? What you should, what, like someone who wants to become a writer for those famous publications like yourself, what he should do or, or she should do? 
Yeah, and that's something I get asked a lot. Some people will say, you know, did did you get did you get some special access to these things? But but no, honestly, there's a submission process on a lot of these sites. They usually have a I just look up their contact information for the site. Some of them will have a submission page or, or an email that you can directly just submit to. So Huffington Post have uh, have a link, have an email where you can submit an article to. And basically that's that's what I did. I, I, I studied what some of these sites were publishing, what kind of articles, the, the type of voice. And you'll notice with a lot of these large publications is they have a certain style. So if you can figure out what their style is and create an article that fits in with that voice of the site, then I wrote an article that that I thought would fit in well, submitted it to an editor, and then I just I would get confirmation and a response from them. So how it works, like they confirm and then they will set a price for it or they have a fixed price? What's the market price? How it works? Yeah, and it depends on the publication. Usually they have contributors, which, uh, which quote-unquote, they, they pay you in exposure. So for Huffington Post, you only get paid if you're a staff writer. But there are usually clauses and and... And, and specific points with being a staff writer. So sometimes you have to sign a, a, a non-compete -comp disclosure. So if I was to, to get paid by the Huffington Post, that would limit what I'm able to write for other sites. So I would have to sign and say, I'm not going to publish my articles on a competing site. If you're a staff writer, if you're a contributor, then you don't get, you don't get paid but you get, uh, I guess you get, yeah, exposure and credibility. But it doesn't limit where you can write. So that's what you've got to weigh up. If you if you get on these sites, usually if you if you have success as a contributor, then they invite you to come on as a staff writer. But depending on the publication, some of them will limit where you can write. So you got to think, what's your approach? Are you eventually going to want to? monetize yourself through your brand alone or are you going to try and monetize through getting paid through other sites so that's that's a personal decision that that you have to come to and if if you decide to write just for them let's say for the entrepreneur magazine or the other uh, famous ones uh, what's the market like how they pay per word per post i think with the the staff positions the the few other publications that i get paid for i get paid per article and some of them base that on per word and and some of that base it on say a minimum one side i write for tells me it's a minimum of 600 words a travel site that i write for uh they pay 25 cents per word so for uh, for 800 words, that, that works out to be $200 an article. So it really varies. You can you can set your price as a freelance worker. You can set it usually as a writer. It's per word. And uh, So and in general, if, for 600 to 1,000 words, like how much those famous publications pay? Um, with Huffington Post and Entrepreneur, uh, honestly, I, I I don't know. I'm a contributor for them. Uh, for the travel site, I think the 200 for um, for 800 words is is mid to high level. So I would I would estimate that that some of these other sites would pay around that that range, probably two to four hundred for say a six to one thousand word article. Uh, as a contributor, like usually you make your profile on th those magazines or publications or they make it for you? No, they typically they allow you about three link backs to any product or site that you have and you're free to write your author bio. So typically that's in, in most of my communications with these sites, they, they say include three links to whatever products you want. So say I've got a coaching program, say I've got 
say my book is finished, I can use a direct link to Amazon for them to, to purchase that. How that help you as an exposure? And also I see sometimes you post the same articles uh, on your site or your blog after posting them on these publications. You don't face issues with Google in that regards or it's okay? You know, there's been a lot of debate about that. I think a, a few years ago you were penalized for having repeat content that was on the internet, but I think those rules have been relaxed and I was actually ha having a conversation with someone recently who's still unsure about that so we're we're kind of in this experimental stage where i'm actually seeing if there's going to be any sort of a um a penalty for doing that but but honestly i haven't there are some sites that will specifically say we only we don't want this article published anywhere so a site like mind body green will say no, you can't publish this anywhere, not even on your own blog. Other sites are more flexible and say, you know, you can you can publish it anywhere. Um, but in terms of traffic, you know, I, I haven't seen any any real dilution of traffic. I still see a lot of exposure on Huffington Post and it's a different audience and then I still see exposure on, on my own site. How do you see the exposure like if uh, if you would just wrote, wrote for your blog without like guest blogging i would i would call it like guest blogging for those uh, publications how that yeah. impacted your brand or your uh, you know more people to to get to know you more sure sure there's one thing that comes with guest blogging and it's it's trust when people continue to visit a site there's an inherent level of trust that comes with it so when I first step out, because my brand is unfamiliar, people are hesitant to, to visit it because there's not that feeling of familiarity and trust. So with these larger sites that I guest post for, people continue to go back and, and visit because I've built that relationship. And, and that's key as well, this whole idea of relationship building the more people visit my site, the more they feel like they have a relationship with me as the writer. But when I was starting off, that's something that's so, so difficult to do. I mean, it's like, it's like going to going back to your favorite restaurant versus going to a restaurant that's just opened down the street. You know, you're not sure if the food is going to be great. You're not sure if the service is going to be great. But to your favorite restaurant, you've got no problems going going back to that. And so these larger sites that that have these larger platforms, larger audiences, it's it, it's been crucial for me in terms of getting extra exposure, and again, just building that level of trust and familiarity. Do you feel? Do, do you like? If I can ask this question, like, do you, do you do you have you at this current point of your life, you are making more money from guest blogging or writing for these publications or from your own products? Um, it's been it's been a balance, and it's been tricky in terms of again figuring out what what is really going to benefit me in the long term and what is really going to align with what I'm passionate about. So originally I was bringing in income through, through personal coaching and, and to be honest, it just, it didn't turn out to be something I was passionate about. It was bringing in good money. Uh, and I I'd, I'd launched, uh, even a, a writing boot camp a little while ago, but I've, I've come to realize it just, it, it's not something that, that sets that fire alight in me. And, and and also even writing for other publications and getting paid for them that that yeah it was bringing in money but but again the the money is kind of meaningless if it doesn't come with with a sense of passion as well and so i've drawn back and i've put all my energy into building my site building my audience uh, and hopefully getting this book out and then having the audience to sell it to and that's one of the key parts in uh, in this book proposal. So, with the book proposal, I've got to show, I've got to keep track of all my articles that have been shared uh, virally. I've got to prove to them that I have an audience to to sell this book to. So I'm working on building my my Facebook group and working on building my 
um, my Twitter following. I'm working on building my my monthly uh, unique views. And all of that, while it doesn't bring in immediate income, uh, because a lot of it is is working just it's a long term for, process. For the yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, so, so you enjoy writing more than coaching uh, writers, or co- I mean, in terms of coaching, you focus on um, coaching people to have the utopian life, or coaching people to be good writers. Both. I've done both uh, originally. Some of it was just about clarifying their their passions and then giving them um, mindset strategy, mindset tools, psychological strategies to cut away any sort of distractions to keep them accountable and to build towards these these goals. Some of them wanted to start similar things like an online blog and how to build an audience, coaching them through that. Other people were just purely... Uh, personal goals that they want to achieve and other people were, were about writing how do they refine their writing and get it to the point where they can get featured on some of these larger publications uh, so you like take uh, on clients that you can help them get featured uh, and how long you, usually the the process of featuring a certain post on these publications takes yeah, there's no, I, I don't do any introductions to editors, it's mostly just given them some of the tools that, that have helped in, in my own writing, some things to think about that they haven't thought about before that, that goes into writing. I mean, looking at how long some of your sentences are, the, the tempo of, of how your article reads. Um, but, yeah, you know, I just I work with them just to get their writing refined and, and, and using the tools that I've used to get onto uh, large publications, but again, it doesn't come down to any any secret strategy. It's just you've eventually just got to think of an article that you think would fit well on these publications and submit it to them. What are some of these major tools that you use? Yeah, it's definitely looking at again the the tempo of your writing. So if you were to read your article out loud, I mean, I really look at a piece almost in a poetic structure. So, so varying up your sentences, sometimes if you have a lot of uh, short sentences, it just, it reads in a very static staccato kind of sense and it's, it's difficult to get through. So how do you just make your, your article flow and trying to minimize any sort of repetition and making sure every sentence that you say contribute some sort of value to the overall article. That's one key thing. Looking at the way that you craft your title, the way that you you use different words, they're all huge elements that, that go into it. The way that you use uh, visual words, including more audio words, including emotional words, where can you insert a story into it, how are you going to back up this point, there are there are plenty of things. You don't you didn't have struggles when shifting from writing blog posts to writing a, a, a book, like in terms of structure and uh, and uh, what yeah. Are, yeah yeah they are similar and, and different in many ways. Also, you could even look at the structure of uh, of an article as a as a boiled down version of a book and, and so a, addressing conflict and, and resolution, you still do that in an article as you would in a book. But I think some of the major issues between, um, between an article and a book is, is a book isn't necessarily a collection of, of articles, but you're still moving through pieces that have a connection and a flow between, say, 50 different related articles. So there are there are huge differences, but at the same time, I think when it comes down to the basics of writing, you're still utilizing the same the same skills for both. From your experience uh, writing blog posts, you feel which one is like more the people prefer in terms of they need to see points, they need to see like sort of paragraphs or. It's interesting. I think people are beginning to 
move away from what they call listicles. So 10 reasons for this, seven reasons for that. Just because the way it seems like culture and intellectual culture works is is it's comparable even to, to fashion, that there are these different trends. And I really feel like we're moving away from these list articles more to, to still short pieces and I'm always studying what's what's trending at the moment and so you have kind of this tension at the moment between listicles because they satisfy that psychological need that we have we like to see things quickly neat. yeah especially and over this, the phone um, yeah but it's not deep it's just like points exactly exactly and I feel like we we may be headed more towards elaborating maybe on a, a single point in an article and, and just digging deeper into one single point rather than moving just from point to point to point. So I'm interested to see what direction we're, we're headed in as a writer also. But if I had to predict what the future is looking like, I feel as though we may be moving away from listicle articles to more in-depth and focusing just on one one point or one topic so i'm interested it's it's interesting to see where it's where it's gonna head but don't you feel that when they see that like especially like myself when i feel when i read the seven points or five points to something or to achieve something it's more attractive to click on and uh, sometimes when you know the style of certain author that it's long you don't you know, tend to click on it, especially if you're reading from phone and uh, you need to really read it deeply. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and there are studies that show, you know, a lot of people will check out, mentally check out or, or not even get through the first paragraph of of an article. And so when people see seven, nine, eight or, or ten, it already registers in their mind what to expect and so people already have that sense of familiarity with the article and that typically engages them even more. Whereas if you just have a blank title and you don't list the numbers, unless you have a very compelling introduction to that article, people aren't sure how long, how long is this article going to be? How much, how much of my time is it going to take to read through but if I look at something and I, I see like there's going to be seven points, I know, okay, that's probably going to take only a few minutes for me to read. And, and they have that sense of expectation and knowing what what's to come in the article. How do you plan your writing? How do you structure it? I usually, I like to try and take a unique angle on and add and contribute something that hasn't been touched on or if it has been touched on, then how do I come at this differently? So I look at some of the leaders in the field, some of the major publications, looking at Huffington Post, looking at the New York Times, the Atlantic, uh, Washington Post, the New Yorker, and with you and what you have to say, that's one thing I've realized in in almost any branding and any work is, yes, while people are interested in what you produce, they're also interested in who's producing that. So the the personality behind what's being said, not just not just simply the content that's being said. But and so you, I try and... Yeah, sorry. But you write, let's say, your thoughts at the beginning before you do the readings or you do the readings first and then you do the writing? Sometimes I change them and sometimes I just write purely what I think about this and then I'll look for studies. I I always try and insert studies into everything that I'm writing about. So looking at journal articles and trying to gain uh, content and sources that, that aren't really touched upon. So looking through academic journals is something that I do a lot. Uh, academia.com and, and just looking through what some professors and universities, what they're producing. So, re- so you look at the top result, uh, results in the search engine or you try to go to certain publications and search about the subject? Yes, yeah, certain, certain publications. So Scientific American is one I look at a lot. Um, Psychology Today 
is another one that I look at a lot at. So looking at peer reviewed journal articles, which means other, other professors and other uh, scientists and psychologists are, are also reading that work as well and using that as, as backup. Do you have a goal, a daily goal, like uh, in terms of words? Sure. I, I'm usually trying to finish three different pieces of work and I've moved away from at one stage I had set myself a, a word limit of, of doing 3,000 words a day. But now I've moved more to three pieces of work. So I'm constantly working on three different articles and, and that allows me to, to have that sense of variety also. You know, I write for an independent news publication and I focus on human rights and culture and I write for a couple of travel magazines. So I usually have a travel article that I'm working on and then in the entrepreneurial and, and uh, healthy living area, I have those articles. So just three pieces of work, whether they're, they're one of those, I try and get I try and get at least two of them done a day and I'm, I'm typically pretty happy with that. Which uh, time you like to write of the day? I'm a morning person, I'm in. So when I was living in Peru, I was waking up at 4.30 in the morning and I would go for a jog in the morning, come back, uh, have a shower, have coffee and then try and get most of my work done in the morning. Usually when I hit six or seven o'clock at night that's when my brain is kind of fried out and so i check out when you agree with the, like you have an agreement with those uh, publications different publications like you have an agreement to send let's say a weekly article or you just whenever you have an article you pitch them uh, for the article based on you feel that this is gonna suit their material yeah mind body green um so I know Elite Daily usually want two articles a week. Uh, Entrepreneur, I submit usually one article a week for them. And Huffington Post, they don't have any expectations, but I like to do one article for them also. And then for my own site, I like to do two articles a week. And recently I've started opening up my site up for guest contributions and guest articles as well. So I've had quite a few submissions to, to feature work there. Uh, when you when you did let's say the structure of your book, um, have you planned to use this material while you're writing the book as a blog posts, or you just keep them private till you finish the book? Yeah, I've I've kept them separate. There's been a few things that have been related, but because my book is 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 quite different to a lot of the work that I'm I'm uh, producing, it's more it's a little bit of a memoir and it's mixed a little bit with uh, very practical areas. And so I haven't really been able to, to double up on, on content, which I think is a good thing. You know, some authors get criticized with saying basically your book is just a collection of your, your blog articles, which I mean, I don't, I don't think that's, that's a bad thing, but for me, uh, the two have been very separate. How to become a uh, travel writer? A lot of it has been, for me, just because I, I, I love traveling, has been very easy in terms of I can just put together an article as, as I travel. But for anyone that, uh, that is looking to get into it, uh, I did an interview with quite a well-known travel writer, uh, Shannon Kaiser, and, and the way she got started was she just went and traveled and just, just did the work. And that's an important thing. A lot of people will will go out and we'll try and contact editors, we'll talk to travel magazines and ask them, how do I get involved? How do I get involved? But if you compare that and pitch that against a person that has just gone to, say, gone to Dubai and written up an article and and taken nice photos, say you're the, the editor, Ahmed, say one person comes to you and say, Ahmed, uh, I really want to be a travel writer for your magazine. Say another person comes to you and say, Ahmed, I have this article that I've just written. I would like to become a travel writer. You're going to go with the person that's got something put together, right? It's, it's that, it's so that it's, saying. So it's about always like the people who write about traveling or it can be just writers because they can afford 
uh, you know, getting paid from online publications. So it doesn't matter where they are. So they travel. It's good for brain to their brains to refresh and travel and see different places while, while they're writing as well. Yeah. So uh, is your question, does the person need to be an established writer to become a travel writer or, or just a traveler? I mean, yeah, you need to reach to a certain level that you know the industry, you know how many articles like you are writing, like you are now, you are targeted, you know how much you have to write, for whom, how much you will get paid. So you know, let's say, how, how much you're going to get to cover your expenses so you can travel, it doesn't matter. And even it will boost your writing, the traveling. Yeah, yeah. And, and that I think part of that depends on if you're you're wanting to do that uh, full time, or if you're just wanting to do a couple of, of travel writing articles as as a hobby, I think it's good to have the industry knowledge and to have the structure of of writing to do it. But it's not absolutely necessary. Obviously, you need to have the skills of of writing uh, to do travel writing. But that's not to say that uh, that any person, an amateur who who enjoys writing couldn't do it i mean if you have that passion and if you've refined your writing to the point where it's publishable nothing is going to stop a person with no experience from going out which is the great thing about the world we live in today with with the internet and with technology is that someone with no experience but has the skills is still able to bring in an income from doing something that they're passionate about so for the amateurs out there, you advise them to go uh, look for these different publications, see how much they pay and try to pitch them and start one by one, by one or what, what do you advise them? Like if you just start again now, uh, what you will do differently or how, what you will do it step by step? Yeah, absolutely. My, my journey has, has been exactly that. I had no formal journalism training i had no formal writing training i i was the amateur and basically it's important to have some sort of an online presence so i just bought a domain name and you know you can use wordpress is great there's a lot of free wordpress themes that you can download i mean you could set up in half an hour you could have uh, a, a site featuring who you are and, and your work Basically, that's what I did, and then I wrote. I just wrote an article and submitted it to uh, a fairly large size site, and they they accepted it, and that's when the exposure began to come in. So, for for any amateur, just stepping out and doing the work. I mean, often we get paralyzed by asking a lot of questions and 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 trying to do research, which is good, but research should always be or go hand in hand with with acting on it and, and and taking some steps forward so for any amateur just just write just go ahead and put together an article that that you think would fit for the publication that you want to submit to and just submit it to them what are the top 5 publications that you recommend amateurs to start with submitting to to get some money Sure. There's one site that's based in, I think, in the, the UK called careeraddict.com. And and they initially uh, take you on just as a contributor and then the, they can start paying uh, for you afterwards. That's a good site to, to start off with. And there's obviously, there's another site called addictedtosuccess.com. They they don't pay, but that's good in exposure. Uh, Problogger.net, they have a, a job board, job listings where writers can find freelance work and you can also submit to them to get exposure also. Obviously, other two sites, Elance and Freelancer.com for any writers to try and get started on them that's also that's also a good way but just to realize the balance of those two in trying to bring in an income for your writing or for your work or realize and be comfortable with the fact that you've got to build your brand and you've got to get exposure for your work as well and it's like that with many uh, 
many different fields and, and many different professions. I mean, when I was wanting to become a chef, I, I was an apprentice and, and even though I was getting paid, I wasn't getting paid much and also I was doing extra work for free to gain the knowledge. I was staying back longer than my shifts. When I was an amateur athlete fighter, I was, I was fighting for free. I was putting in a lot of hours. So with any dream that, that you pursue after, to, to view time as, as a good uh, ROI, you know, you're, you're going to get returns on your investment of time. You're going to gain knowledge and, and grow in that area. Do you edit your own writing and or you send it to an editor? Uh, do you edit while you are writing or you edit after you finish the writing? At the moment, I, I edit my work. I have some readers who, some loyal readers that will pick up any, any typos if they do get through. I mean, for sites like Huffington Post and Entrepreneur, they have their own editors as well. But I always like to edit before I submit to them. But one habit I've learned is is once I finish an article, I'll completely walk away for for at least a couple of hours before I come back. And, and even in that short time, it seems as if your your eyes freshen up to the work that you've done and you're you're able to see things in a, a clearer light. So I, I try and edit as I go, but I, I certainly edit once I'm done and then usually take a break and then come back to it and, and have another read through, even if I, I leave it overnight often also before I go back. How do you write efficiently? Like what are the most, uh, you know, top three, top five techniques that you do to write efficiently or habits? Sure. There's, there's one technique just called a flow of consciousness writing, which I would do a lot most evenings and and just set yourself a limit of one page, two page where you put aside any critical factors or critical lens that you have and basically you shut off that that inner dialogue that likes to critique everything that we do and you just, just write, just let your consciousness flow and, and just build that habit of, of writing. I mean, a lot of times writer's block happens because we overanalyze what we're writing. So to step back from that analysis factor and just to write out without any judgment, without any critique, that's one thing. Creating the habit of, of just setting that space in your house that becomes your, your writing oasis or your work oasis, wherever it is. It might be that room in your house. But familiarity always breeds and creates that environment for more conducive work. So if, if you sit down at your desk, your your brain and your mind acknowledges this is my workspace and, and you're able to engage in that. So finding a place that that you're comfortable with makes makes it conducive for, for your work. And again, building those those habits of writing, whether figuring out whether you're a morning person, whether you're an evening person finding out where these hot spots are uh, that, that are most conducive for you to do work. So those are, are, are three basic ones. Um, I'm going to ask you about so, some of the materials that you, are, uh, that you have wrote and you're expert on, how people can quit their miserable jobs. Yeah, and that's, you know, a, a lot of times it's, it's difficult for us to see the mess objectively when we're when we're in the middle of things and this whole idea of of being in a miserable job you know for a lot of people that's not what they no nobody nobody actively seeks to be in a miserable position but it's kind of flowed out of things that that came out of unexpected things so firstly making that distinguishment between you know is it is it the whole field and profession as a whole that you're dissatisfied with or just the position that you're in? Sometimes it only takes a little bit of a shift in your role uh, to be able to get out of, of that miserable position. Um, for, for myself, it was basically seeking validation in where you want to go. So I'd, I'd be hesitant just to jump straight out of where you are into something else without getting the validation that that you need so 
say that I was I was a chef and I wanted to and I was miserable with that and I wanted to become a writer, it would be somewhat foolish for me just to quit my job, my miserable cooking job and jump into writing without the validation. I think that's one key thing you need to seek after is validation for what you want to head into because you might be passionate about it, but you might not be. Passion doesn't mean that that you're good at it, right? Passion doesn't mean that you're going to be able to create a living out of that. At that moment, it doesn't mean that it's not possible at all. You just need to get your skills to a level that it is possible. So if I was miserable as a chef and I wanted to become a writer, the first thing I would do was evaluate my skill level in the field that I want to get into. So I would see where my level of writing is is at and try and validate that by submitting posts. And if I send out five articles and I get rejected by all five, obviously that tells me that that I'm not I'm not ready to step away from my miserable job yet. If I wanted to be uh, a podcaster or if I wanted to start a business in a different field, perhaps do some free consulting and, and see how many people are, are interested in and, and just gain feedback from from what you what you want to get into. So seeking validation would be the first and crucial step and then evaluating from there how far you need to go in order to build a viable business from that. How do you declutter your life and what do you advise people to declutter out their life? Start with one area and refine that. I believe that there are so many interconnected areas in life. In in Australia, if you go to rent a house, a lot of the times the the housing agents will be sneaky and they'll look inside your car and see how well you maintain your your vehicle because that gives them an idea of how clean and how well you'll maintain a house. And, and that's so true that so much of our lives are interconnected. So if you focus on one area, naturally that's going to flow into other areas of, of your life. For anyone that's been in military service, you know that one of the first things that you do in the morning is to to make your bed neat and tidy and perfect because you build success in, in one area of life, it flows into another area. There's a great quote that says, how you do anything is how you do everything. So people often get overwhelmed at a question like, how do I declutter my life? Because all of a sudden I look at the the overall mess of my life, but realizing, again, it's like that other quote, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? You work on small areas, so you just begin by decluttering your your living room and making sure that living room is perfect, making sure your desktop on your computer is is always tidy. And when you repeatedly build that habit in one area, it naturally flows into other areas. So for someone who wants to declutter, look at where you're immediately at and how do you how do you clean up that immediate area that you're in? So start with the room that you're in and no doubt they'll flow into other areas. How to have a beautiful and meaningful life, especially after this journey of trying different careers and different areas of, of, of life traveling and different writing and other stuff? Yeah, and I think two things that are key is finding inherent value and finding external value. So inherently, what makes you what makes you happy and what makes you excited and how do you leverage that to contribute to someone else's life? I think those are, <clears throat> are two key areas that when happiness is solely confined to who we are, that seems to run out quite quickly. But if you look at extending that beyond who you are, then you have something not only sustainable, but something that that is more whole in the human experience. If you look at a lot of the 
most successful entrepreneurs and, and people in, in the world, their, their success always extends beyond who they are and they're, they're building something beyond their own life. But that goes back to finding something that, that really excites you. So something that not only you're, you're good at, but, but you're passionate about, but also influences people outside of your own life. Success happy versus happiness versus uh, fulfillment, and which one is uh, more important? You know, I, I really think that you could almost bundle the three of them together. I, I don't think success, even though it does happen, success shouldn't come to the exclusion of, of happiness. So I do believe you can be you can be successful and, and very unhappy. You know, you can become the CEO of a company and be very unhappy. At the same time, you can be both that and still unfulfilled. You know, success can come with happiness, but can still come without fulfillment. And, and if I had to tie in each one of them, success could be this one dimensional, I'm the CEO, I'm making six figures happiness could be that it aligns with something I'm passionate about because you can be successful at something that you're not passionate about at all. I could be successful as a chef and still be unhappy because it misses out on that passion element. So success would have to include something that you're passionate about. And then fulfillment is this idea of something that's beyond yourself. To be fulfilled, I think the key area is uh, to contribute to to the world to feel like what you're doing matters. So, uh, so for the three of them to be pulled together, I think that's that's crucial. I don't think we should aim at any single one of them to the exclusion of the other. How people can find their purpose? Like if they don't know where to go, what what how they can find uh, their purpose? And why it's important to have a purpose. Yeah, I think a great way is just to imagine imagine what your perfect day would look like and and take away some of these elements. So think about a lot of times we we, we try and build our lives around something that 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 really doesn't really influence what your purpose is. So society is built so much around uh, materialism and the pursuit of money, which is important. I'm not saying they're not important things, but they influence the decisions that we make in a way that don't help us in finding out what our purpose is. And, and really your purpose basically should be what, what excites you, what you love doing. But we let the influence of how do I make a living out of this influence our decision, which is, a secondary issue, you know, purpose should come first. And that comes from finding what you, what you love doing. So if I was to ask you if money wasn't an issue at all, if, if you knew you were going to be successful, what would you do with your life? And personally, that's been a great question in finding out what my purpose is. And in people that, that I've coached, simply asking that question has been liberating and realizing that, I shouldn't base my purpose and my passion around whether I'm going to be rich around it. But sadly, a lot of us do that. So removing that factor is really helpful. What are the hidden, uh, hidden blessing in, in failure and rejection and losing? Yeah, you know, we, and even with, I ran an article recently just about emotions as well, is that we we try our best to, avoid negative situations. Um, but really there's not a person in life who is immune to negativity in life. And so how do we, how do we reappraise these negatives and things like losing and, and failure? You've got to realize that they come out of progress and progress is the key in, in almost anything. As long as you're moving forward, as long as you're turning up each day and trying to do something, that's progress. And when you do hit obstacles, 
it shouldn't be viewed necessarily as as a failure but if you change your lens of thinking and seeing these as carrying lessons i mean they're all feedback and, and information on how you can infu- uh, improve and how you can redirect and, and change directions so marcus aurelius is a uh, a really famous ancient Roman emperor and he had this great quote that says that if you're disturbed or upset by anything external, the pain isn't due to that external thing but your perception of it. So when you change your perception of something, it changes the experience of it also. So I've learned to view any failure as as a lesson. And so if you make that decision now in your life that any difficulty that comes your way is a blessing in disguise and you begin to look for that, you're inevitably going to find something in it. So the the rejected article doesn't become my writing is terrible. The rejected article just means that I know now not what to do in my next article. And just viewing things in a supportive way rather than a destructive way. Why it's important to ha- to make or have a silence uh, in our life or having rest? Certainly, a lot of that comes down to our also our internal dialogue and the noisy world we live in. We live in a world, and technology is great. I love how small the world is getting in terms of technology in terms of access to information but at the same time you've got to think solely of of who you are and realizing that none of these things are a part of who you are so what silence does is ultimately it it strips you down to one of the most difficult things that we have to deal with, which is ourselves and our internal dialogue. And a lot of people call it the imposter syndrome or the lizard brain. We have this constant feedback going through our mind and silence allows us to confront that that voice and oftentimes the negativity that it instills and, and talks to us in, in that way and really confront yourself and I believe a lot of success comes down to self-mastery. If you're able to master your emotional self, your psychological self, then you're able to master a lot of the external things in life. So silence and and solitude has a way of basically confronting yourself and confronting your own inner demons and inner doubts. Along with that, silence has been shown just to have great benefits for creativity We go through a process when we have insights and aha moments called an incubation period where our subconscious, our unconscious mind is constantly being exposed to so much information. And then when we take a step back, it allows all of this information to to settle, to kind of marinate. And then from that, we have clarity and we have these insights that, that stem from that. So living in a noisy world, silence is just crucial for us to step back, to be able to to breathe, to separate ourselves for a bit and and to enter back into the crazy world that we live in. What do you do to boost your brain as a a writer? You know, there are these things called binaural beats. I don't know if you've you've heard of them. Um, It... What it does, and you can find a lot of them on on YouTube or you can buy some of the CDs, but basically our brain emits different frequencies and they've been able to measure this in neuropsychology uh, where you have your alpha waves, your beta waves, your delta waves, and and your gamma waves are when you experience high-level insights from that incubation period that I mentioned. So what binaural beats are is they send one frequency into one ear and then a different frequency into another ear and your brain balances out these two different frequencies and they put you in a mode of of, of different concentration of alpha beta or, or delta or gamma so that's one thing that i do sometimes obviously diet and and eating 
I guess, omega-3 rich foods that are shown to, uh, to improve like brain efficiency and focus. So foods like avocado, salmon, uh, flaxseed, blueberries, avocados, uh, different nuts. So looking after your health is crucial for your, your brain health as well. And then different nootropics, um, again, with the, the binaural beats, but also uh, ginkgo, green tea, they've been shown to have great benefits for, for your brain also. What are some of the habits that you're trying to develop to stay efficient and productive? Um, timing, daily timing uh, is, is definitely a huge thing. So waking up at the same time. Um, I, I also use some different psychological habits also. One is, uh, is exposing myself to difficulty on a daily basis. <clears throat> and I do that physically through having, uh, having a cold shower. I'll have uh, a normal level, a normal temperature shower, warm, hot. But then to finish it off, I turn it on completely cold. But while I do that, I, I remind myself that, that I endure all difficulties and I overcome all obstacles. And it's, it's a personal mantra that I say to myself, and just to reinforce that, I'll turn on the cold water. So it's not only a psychological thing that I'm using these affirmations, but also a physical enduring of going through the cold water. And it's basically building off that. They call it the, the psychosomatic relationship between your mind and body. And there's an author named Malcolm Gladwell who has a book called uh, Blink. And he talks about this psychosomatic relationship where they did one study they took a group of people and they got them to read words that were related with being old. So they read words like bingo, Florida, shuffleboard, um, and, and different words like this. And they measured the speed at which they walked into the study as to when they walked out of it. And simply reading a word, because, I mean, words are basically labels for a concept or an experience, so when they read these words, the brain began to, to register these words and it, it truly affected the body. So the body and mind are fascinating in their relationship. Something as simple as a word can trigger off a neurological and physical response. So that's what I'm doing in trying to create that habit with, with having this cold shower, but at the same time reminding myself that difficulties and obstacles are going to be an inevitable part of of this journey but i embrace them and i overcome them and then my body is reminded of it through the cold shower as well how will your like work life routine look like when you wake up in the morning till you sleep i try and get out quite early so before five o'clock and and then go for a jog first thing just to to keep healthy to keep fit then I come back, have a coffee, sit down and write for a few hours. I usually work in, in two-hour spurts. So I just try and focus and concentrate and write for about uh, 40, 50 minutes, take like a 10-minute break, and then again 40 or 50 minutes, take, a, take a, a longer break after two hours, and then have something to eat, go back to it again. And I try and re write in three three stages, so three two-hour stages, and get in and work on those three different pieces of, of work that I, I mentioned earlier and then spend the other time networking, emailing people back, working on social media. Best tools or hacks that you use for writing and for traveling? There's one great app that's been a lifesaver called Self Control. And basically what I'm able to do on that is just write down sites that I'm blocked for for those two hours. So I put in my, all my email accounts, I put in all my social media accounts onto self-control and I activate that for the two hours that I do work. So it just essentially blocks out those sites. I can't access them. I can't check my email. All I can do is just focus on my writing and work. It's uh, on Mac or... Uh, it's available for, for both, I'm pretty sure. So selfcontrol.com, I think. I'll, I'll double check and just confirm with you, but it's been, it's been a brilliant app. And then obviously Evernote has been, has been really good just in 
cataloging and keeping keeping track of all the useful resources and uh, research that I come across. What are your other hobbies? Ooh, I'm I'm a pretty boring guy actually. I mean, I I read. And I write a lot. Um, I guess I love getting outdoors and, and going for hikes. That's one thing when I travel is is I just love walking around and exploring the different cities that I was in. You know, I'm in Houston now. Previously, I just got here from New Jersey, and it was great just to go for a jog around New Jersey. I was in Brooklyn just to walk around Brooklyn and New York, and same as San Francisco. I was there before, and. So I just like getting out and just exploring cities and finding nice coffee shops to sit down and and check out. Uh, top three writers and top three authors. Ooh, top three writers that I really look up to. Um, Gretchen Rubin, she's a great writer. Um, Anne Lamott and. Ooh, Jeff Goins would be another good writer. Top three authors, certainly Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, Andrew Solomon is another great writer. And I really enjoy Elizabeth Gilbert's work also. Top three mentors. Top three mentors. I'd have to say a good personal mentor is a, a philosopher and a professor based here in Houston named Russell Minnick, and he has his own site, russellminnick.com. Uh, Kamanzi Constable, he's uh, another blogger and writer who's been a, a good mentor to me. And uh, I'd have to say a more distant uh, on a, a non-personal level is is Andrew Solomon. I follow his work and we've interacted through email, but he's, he's probably a mentor in a more distant sense. Uh, most important factors for success in three words. Keep showing up. What's the biggest failure moment in your life? And what did you learn from it? Oh, I guess a recent failure um, is talking about something before it came to pass. So originally I had a book planned that that I wanted to be out in October last year. And I, I did a few podcasts where I talked about having this book out in in October. But again, what we talked about earlier, having that clear path of expectation and then things turning out much different to what we planned. That's what happened. I was talking about this book and it coming out in October 2014. And then things really took a, a different term, uh, turn in, in terms of connecting with different literary agents and, and changing the theme and style for my for my books, I've learned, you know, I, I felt like a, a bit of a, I guess, a loss of integrity because I was getting out publicly and I was saying my book's going to be out in October, but then all of a sudden I, I changed directions and, and and it was just something that was, you know, I, I felt like I really needed to do, but I just I felt like there was an issue where I probably lost a little bit of trust with with my audience and audiences of other podcasts that probably expected this book to be out at a certain time and didn't come out. So, so I'd see that just as a, as a small bit, but at the same time, a failure that, that had some, some effect that I'd like to avoid in the future. So I've moved away from talking about things that I'm not sure completely about. certain about and, and just, just waiting for the product to be more concrete or even after the product is out to talk about it. So you pitch the, the, let's say, publishers or literary agents first and then you write the book or you write the book, finish it, and then pitch them? First, I was actually going to self-publish it, which is a lot of what, what writers and potential authors are doing. Uh, and it a lot of it depends on, on fiction and nonfiction. The way a lot of people with fiction books a lot of publishing houses want to see the completed work 
um, and, and want to see the whole product out there. For whatever reason, I'm, I'm not too sure. But with nonfiction work, which is what I'm working on, usually they want to see just the book proposal and three to five chapters that you've completed because I guess they want more of a say in the direction of it and, and, and just more feedback involved there. So with my work, it's, it's just been put, putting together the first few chapters, looking at the marketability of it, so looking at your own audience and your strategy for marketing the book. Basically, they want to know um, that they can invest in you and see returns on that investment. So what's your audience look like? What's your strategy What's your competition at the moment and how does your book stand apart from that competition? So, Two to three yeah, chapters pretty, edited or just once yeah, you just edit, write, edited? Edited, uh, but in saying that they still have the freedom to, to suggest and, and re-edit that also. Publishing versus self-publishing, why did you shift and what do you think, which which uh, route, I mean, the author should go if, if he can have both? At the moment, there is there's still the sense where there's a sense of credibility that comes with a publishing house and that can change in the future because self-publishing is gaining more and more credibility because there are some very good writers and authors that are self-publishing. But the reason I guess I shifted over to wanting um, wanting to, to publish with a publishing house is I want to leverage also, if I can connect with a good publishing house, connect with their PR agency and their marketing strategies and trusting that they have a solid strategy for getting the book out there and there's still, again, that, that notion, that idea that there is that credibility that comes with a traditional publisher. So that's one reason that, that I went over. Also, some of the early success that I've had with being featured on uh, some of these larger publications, people have encouraged me to go and seek after a traditional publisher because I have the credibility and because I have the growing audience. So that was another factor that worked towards me changing directions. What's the best advice that you have ever received? Oh, the best advice is, is follow one course until success. That came from uh, John Lee Dumas, who I, who I interviewed. And that's been helpful. You know, there's been times that I've been tempted to, to again, step into to different fields and, and spread myself thinner, but just to, just to draw back and just to focus on that one thing, which is the book now at the moment until I see some success come from that. What would you advise your younger self if you have the chance? To enjoy the journey a lot more and, and to focus, still focus on the destination and the goal but balance that out with stopping every now and then and just reflecting on how far you have come uh, as you continue to head towards that dream. Your favorite quote? It'd probably have to be that, uh, that Zen proverb that I mentioned earlier, you know, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And it's just a reminder that anytime we achieve a goal or a level of success just to be reminded that we're still who we are, that there's still work to be done, that there's, there's still a level of, of things that, that shouldn't change through, through success as well. Top three people that you're inspired by? I'd have to say... John Lee Dumas is one in stepping out and leaving his career in, in law and real estate to start a podcast and a very successful podcast at that. That has been something that, that really inspires me. Someone kind of from left field actually is uh, Bethany Hamilton. I don't know if you've heard of her. She she is the, the major 
feature in the movie Soul Surfer, but she got attacked by a shark and lost her, her entire arm in the shark attack. And she was pitched to become this uh, incredibly um, incredible world champion surfer. And then when she had the shark attack, everyone completely wrote her off and said, she's finished and now she's bounced back. She learned how to surf and balance with one arm and is now a world champion surfer. So she inspires me just on a a very personal level. Another lady, her name is uh, uh, Diane Nyad. She's the first, first person of any gender, any age to swim from Cuba to Florida. And she did that at the age of 64 with, without a shark tank and on her fifth attempt. So she failed four times leading up to that over, I think, since she was the age of 28. So some, for something like just shy of 40 years, she continued to seek after this dream and it took her close to 40 years, but, but she achieved it and she was the first person uh, to do that. So it was just a reminder for me to take a step back and even though I can be very impatient sometimes about achieving my goals, realizing that, hey, this may, this may take a lifetime, but if you're that passionate about this dream of yours, then to keep, keep showing up, keep, keep doing the work and, and just embrace that journey and trust that you're going to reach your destination. Top three books. Top three books, I'd have to say. Far from the tree, from Andrew Solomon, and that's 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 much less practical than uh, than what most people may suggest. But I think it's a great book in just understanding who you are and the aspects that you can change about yourself and the aspects that you can't change about yourself. So he gives this illustration in it the distinction between your vertical identity and your horizontal identity. And I won't go into it in depth, but it's basically just thinking, finding out who you are, embracing the things that you can't change about yourself, but leveraging the things that you can change about yourself. That'd be the first book. I think The Alchemist is a powerful book. Everyone usually recommends that book. And that's just uh, a very powerful book for, for this journey of life that we're all on. I think... Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. That's another great book. It's uh, you know it's it's been around for, for for years and years. I think he was what eighty eighty BC, or I probably got my dates wrong. But ancient Roman emperor. That's a powerful book. I'd recommend. Last question: um, What makes you really happy? Being able to wake up every day. And do something I love. Uh, how people can contact you? Yeah, I'd love to connect with your your audience, Ahmed. So, theutopianlife.com is probably the the most simple and the best way to connect. I have my uh, Facebook group connected to that site, and and also Twitter. And yeah, if there's if there's anyone that's just seeking advice on 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 how to step out and live your dream, I'd be more that more than happy to help them out. Thank you so much, Ty, for this very, very rich uh, information and knowledge that you shared with us. All right, thank you, and thank you for what you do. I mean, I, I think it's great to be able to inspire others, and 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 I, I'm very, um, very flattered to to be on, and thankful for the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Be efficient and stay efficient, and see you soon with another. Podcast.